Very glad to have uh, Professor Shimon Zandbach with us, who will be the third speaker on this session. Professor Zandbach, as you know, is a professor emeritus of comparative literature at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and the Israel Prize Laureate for Literary Translation 96. He had further received the Chernikovsky Award for Translation 94. Among his numerous activities, in addition to teaching, let me mention his membership at the Academy of the Hebrew Language, where he chaired the Committee for Literary Terminology, as well as his mem membership at the Council for Higher Education, Malag, at the Board of Trustees of the National Theatre Abima, and the Editorial Board of Amoved. Professor Zandbach published two novels, a memoir, and several research books, and has translated among others, Kafka, Chaucer, Shakespeare, Brecht, Paul Celan, and Rilke. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Rachel Weisbord for inviting me. And uh, I'd like to say that the dealings with her have been always very pleasant. Uh, second, I'd like to say that I'm not a theoretician uh, or a philosopher, and I come from practical translation, so that I'm venturing into a subject which I shouldn't venture into, I suppose. But um, so regard what I have to say as uh, uh, said by an amateur, but um, remember that I come from poetry, and this is what really matters in this case. OK. Uh, Walter Benjamin, the task of the translator, his introduction to his translation of Baudelaire's Tableau Parisien, was published in 1923, translated into English by Harry Zorn in uh, what's happening? Oh. In Benjamin's uh, Illuminations, which uh, Hannah Arendt edited, and again by Stephen Rendell, I'll quote him. Uh, a Hebrew translation by Nili Mielski came out in Chadarim in uh, 1993. Now, the first paragraph of Benjamin's essay already strikes one with its bold repudiation of what seems an obvious truth, indeed a cliché. No poem, says Benjamin, is meant for the reader. No picture for the beholder. No symphony for the audience. From the four elements that make up the literary event, writer, work, world, and audience, the last one, audience, is crossed out. Not only is the critical approach, which focuses on the audience, what is known as reader response criticism, rejected, but the very assumption that the reader or spectator or listener is a necessary element in the work of art is flatly denied. Poem and picture, no less than symphony, are bereft of their communicative element, of the belief that they contain a message at all. Indeed, they are entirely cut off from all human response. As Benjamin says later on, we could still speak of an unforgettable life or moment even if all human beings had forgotten it. If it is still unforgettable, says Benjamin, its memory is kept not by men, but in the mind of God. The theological mystical line taken here is integral to Benjamin's concept of translation. And we shall later come back to it. For the moment, let us focus on the way he purges the work of art of its communicative element. Such a step, possibly acceptable when it comes to a symphony, seems downright bizarre 
when applied to translation, Benjamin's subject here. For isn't it the very rationale of translation to be intended for the reader who does not understand the text in the original? Isn't its very raison d'etre the transmission to such a reader of what the original says? But it is precisely Benjamin's point that the essence of a literary text is not what it says. Uh, look up the handout number one. What does a poem say then? What does it communicate? Very little to a person who understands it. Neither message nor statement is essential to it. However, a translation that seeks to transmit something can transmit nothing other than a message that is something inessential. Bad translation can be defined as inexact transmission of an inessential content. And we never get beyond this so long as translation claims to serve the reader. Serving the reader and transmitting the inessential go together. A translation that undertakes to transmit what is essential cannot be intended for the reader and vice versa. A translation intended for the reader cannot transmit what is essential. What is essential is not the referent, but the mode of referring to it. Not das Gemeinte, but the art des Meinens. Benjamin, it turns out, leaves out not only the reader, but the referent, the reflected or signified universe as well. Another element of the four elements of the literary event is denied, is deleted, or at least dismissed as inessential. And we are left with only two basic elements, writer and work. The type of translation Benjamin has in mind when he deprives it both of audience and of referent cannot possibly be the translation of an informative text, an article on quantum theory or a study of Persian archaeology. In such non-literary texts, the essence of the text is obviously its message and the translation cannot but be intended for the reader. What Benjamin has in mind, on the other hand, is obviously the translation of poetry or any literary text. His dismissal in such texts of the referent in favor of the mode of referring is in line with the tradition of symbolist poetics and la poésie pure. Mallarmé's word, fleur, absence from all the bouquets, it's the famous quotation where he says, I say fleur, and mus musically emerges a, the flower that is absent from all bouquets. Um, or Flaubert's book about nothing, held together by the strength of its style, as he writes to Louise Collet. To the symbolists or Flaubert, however, it is the reader who is the location in which the literary event takes place, even when it is about nothing. Baudelaire in Au Lecteur, the introductory poem to Les Fleurs du Mal, even goes to the length of addressing his reader as mon semblable, mon frère, my alias, my twin, in Richard Howe's translation. Not so Benjamin. To him, the reader is not at all the translator's twin. The literary act, including literary translation, has nothing to do with his response. Translation of literature is an exclusive relationship created by the translator between two texts while the reader remains outside. It is carried out for the sake of the text, not of the reader. 
But how can a translation be carried out for the sake of the text? Can it improve it? Can a translation produce, as the joke, the old joke has it, for Teitsch and for Besser, the version of the original? Benjamin's surprising claim is that it can. Moreover, that it should. That it is the task of the translator to lead the original toward its ideal version, toward the ultimate, unsayable poem, which both the original poem and all its translated versions aspire towards but never reach. At this point, we are clearly back to the theological and mystical basis of Benjamin's theory of translation. For to him, the ultimate task of the translator is not the creation of a faithful English or French or whatever equivalent of the original poem, but the progression toward a utopian model of a poem that exists silently beyond all translated versions. We now realize that literary translation to Benjamin is far from being a specific attempt to find the best equivalent for a specific text. It is rather one tiny step in a global movement towards the restoration of paradise lost through its paradis paradisical language. It is the participation in the metaphysical task of overcoming the catastrophe of the Tower of Babel and returning to the one global Adamic language. Um, handout number two. The translator's great motive is that of integrating the plurality of languages into a single true language in which the languages agree, complemented and reconciled with each other in their mode of intention, in the artilus minus. If there is a language of truth in which the ultimate secrets toward which all thinking strives are stored up at peace and even silent, then this language of truth is the true language. And in fact, this language in the anticipation description of which lies the only perfection philosophy can hope to achieve is concealed intensively in translations. The relationship between original and translation thus is not resemblance but completion. The translated poem complements the original poem in its progress towards pure language beyond all languages. Benjamin's memorable image, image for this operation is the fitting together of the fragments of a broken vessel. Number three in the handout. Just as fragments of a vessel, in order to be fitted together, must correspond to each other in the tiniest details, but need not resemble each other, so translation, instead of making itself resemble the meaning of the original, must lovingly and in detail fashion in its own language a counterpart to the original's mode of intention, again, artist minus, in order to make both of them recognizable as fragments of a vessel, as fragments of a greater language." Unquote. The translation thus complements the original by fashioning in its own language a counterpart to the original's mode of intention. But how is this to be done? Is this task practicable? What is a mode of intention and what is its counterpart in the target language? And how does this counterpart complement the original 
and put it in movement toward the greater language. To define mode of intention, Benjamin uses the example of the German word brot and its French equivalent, pain. The intended object is the same in both languages, but the mode of intention is radically different. That is, the connotations are different. To fashion a German counterpart to pain, the translator must not make do with the equivalent referent. He must find the connotative counterpart. In doing so, he will subvert the mode of intention of his own language, will break through the rotten barriers of his own language. Benjamin quotes Rudolf Panwitz, a German philosopher. Our translations, this is Panwitz, our translations, even the best, start out from a false principle. They want to Germanize Indic, Greek, English, instead of indicizing, Greekizing, Anglicizing German. They are far more awed by their own linguistic habits than by the spirit of the foreign work. The fundamental error of the translator is that he holds fast to the state in which his own language happens to be, rather than allowing it to be put powerfully in movement by the foreign language. Hence, a translation that reads like an original work in the translator's own language is a bad translation, for it stands like a wall in front of the language of the original. A literal translation, on the other hand, by exposing the differences between the source language and the target language, by refraining from masking the insufficiencies of the former of the source language, and by underlining the insufficiencies of the target language, paves the way toward pure language, which is exempt from all insufficiency. Literal translation, uh, quote, is transparent. It does not obscure the original, does not stand in its light, but rather allows pure language, as if strengthened by its own medium, to shine even more fully on the original. How does pure language shine on the original more fully, thanks to the literal translation of the orig original? How does translation by breaking through the barriers of its own language and fashioning in it a counterpart to the mode of intention of the original language, advance the translated text towards pure language. In the rest of this paper, which is not very long, I wish to describe two answers to this question by Peter Sondi and by Paul de Man and Barbara Johnson. The juxtaposition of the two answers may throw some light on Benjamin's enigmatic <coughs> essay. The Hungarian-born literary scholar Peter Sondi was a great admirer of Paul Celan and tragically followed him and committed suicide a year and a half after Celan's suicide. One of his last texts, which he planned to be included in what he calls a petit bouquin sur Paul, was an article entitled Poetry of Constancy, Poetik der Beständigkeit, Celan's Übertragung von Shakespeare's Sonnet 105. Um, you have it in the handout, number four. Um, okay, we'll come back to it in a minute. Uh, although the uh, 
uh, Sondi's article deals with Celan's method of translation and only by the way with Benjamin's theory of translation, it offers, I believe, one way of understanding Benjamin and answering the above question. Um, okay, let's, uh, maybe I, I'll read to you the Shakespearean sonnet and uh, then perhaps we'll, we'll refer to one or two lines in the German translation to see what, Celans, what uh, Sondi says about Celan's tra uh, translation of Shakespeare. Let not my love be called idolatry, nor my beloved as an idol show, since all alike my songs and praises be to one of one, still such and ever so. Kind is my love today, tomorrow kind, still constant in a wondrous excellence, therefore my verse to constancy confined, one thing expressing leaves out difference. Fair, kind and true is all my argument. Fair, kind and true, varying to other words, and in this change is my invention spent, three themes in one, which wondrous scope affords. Fair, kind and true, have often lived alone, which three till now never kept seat in one. It's a poem about constancy. I mean, the, let, my, let not my love be called idolatry or an idol. All my songs, all my praises are to him. Yeah, this, this sort of what he calls uh, uh, poetry of constancy. Okay, now, uh, in number five of the handout, we have a quotation from um, Sondi saying, Benjamin saw the legitimacy, indeed the necessity, of translating as lying in the different intentions toward language and modes of signification displayed by an original text and its translation. In Celan's version of Shakespeare's sonnet number 105, the mode of signification differs from that of the original, says Sondi, in that constancy, the subject of the sonnet is not merely the intended meaning, it characterizes the verse itself. Namely, it's not just declared as in Shakespeare, but is performed in the verse itself. How does constancy characterize the verse itself? By means of linguistic repetitions and similarities in the translation, which embody in language itself the constancy which is only spoken about in Shakespeare's original. Sondi's brilliant analysis of how this happens is too intricate to be described here. I'll, I'll, I'll limit myself to one example. Uh, take the line uh, on the first line of the second page. Kind is my love today, tomorrow kind. Kind is my love today, tomorrow kind. The structure is chiastic, A, B, B, A. Kind is my love today, tomorrow kind, yes? A, B, B, A. Now, in Celan's translation, it's gut ist mein Freund, ist heute und ist morgen. There's no chiastic structure at all. There's only a repetition of his goodness, which is uh, the goodness of the friend today and tomorrow with a triple uh, repetition of the word ist. Good ist, my friend, ist heute, ist morgen. Okay? Now, this is one example, and I, I'm not going to, uh, you know, to tire you with other examples, but uh, throughout you have um, schön, gut und treu, das singe ich und singe, for instance, or ich find, er find. Uh, I mean, in all these cases, you have what Sondi regards as a performance of the constancy in the verse itself by the uh, duality of flow and repetition in the flow, yes? Constant 
kviut uh, means that the same thing is, uh, 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 appears time and again in spite of the fact that time runs and goes its way. Um, OK. Next, Sondi makes a mental jump, uh, which is brilliant but questionable. He relates Celan's realization of constancy by means of ling linguistic repetition and similarities. He relates it to Roman Jakobson's famous principle of equivalence, yes, repetition as the constitutive device of the line in poetry. Now, uh, he says that Celan's version of this sonnet comes more closely than any previous poem to the realization of this principle, the Jacobsonian principle of, equivalent, of equivalence. Uh, now, to jump from this particular sonnet to um, the generalization by Jacobson is questionable because Celan's use of equivalence is limited to the, his translation. Of course, you can find it very often in his poetry, but in this case, it's limited to his translation of this particular sonnet and has to do with his wish to embody consensus in the form of this particular sonnet, whereas Jacobson's equivalence is meant to apply to poetic language as such. But Sondi, it seems, regards the difference in what Benjamin calls intention towards language between Shakespeare dealing with constancy and Celan performing constantly or embodying it in the form, in the verse itself, he regards this as a major general change in the history of poetry in the wake of Mallarmé and symbolism. Uh, going back to our question concerning the way translation is supposed, according to Benjamin, to lead the way to the ultimate poem in the true language, Sondi's implied answer seemed to be that by advancing from the referential or discursive to the poetic use of language, from discursive to non-discursive, translation can bring the translated text closer to Mallarmé's immortal word, which is always silent. It is silent because, to quote Sondi's conclusion to his essay, it does not deal with itself, but is itself. Now, Paul de Man, in a lecture at Cornell University in 1983, entitled Conclusions on Walter Benjamin's The Task of the Translator, and later included in its posthumous book, Resistance to Theory, which was uh, translated by Shai Ginsburg, came out in wrestling, I think, Hitnagdut um, in, Leteoria. In, in this, book, in, in this uh, lecture on Walter Benjamin's The Task of the Translator, he offers what seems like a diametrically opposed reading of Benjamin, a deconstructive reading, largely based on Derrida's uh, uh, Detour de Babel, which is also translated to Hebrew by uh, Michal ben Naftali. Naftulei Babel, it's called in Hebrew. Uh, the late uh, Barbara Johnson, a disciple of De Man, largely follow his reading of Benjamin in a chapter on the task of the translator, which is included in her book, Mother Tongues, that came out in 2003, an eccentric but uh, fascinating joint study of Benjamin Baudelaire and Sylvia Plath, of all people. Uh, if to Sondi, translation a la Benjamin is the promotion of a text, to De Man and Johnson, it is its disintegration. Translation shows in the, uh, uh, look up the number six in the handout. Translation shows in the original 
a mobility, an instability, which at first one did not notice. Like critical philosophy, or like literary theory as Deman sees it, translation undoes the original, reveals an essential failure, an essential disarticulation, which was already there in the original. Translation in Deman's most radical formulation kills the original by discovering that the original was already dead. The task of the translator, Sondi says, is to, advan to advance the text toward admittedly unreachable wholeness. The task of the translator, the deconstructionists say, is to underline the text distance from wholeness. How the, does the translator discover that the original is already dead? And where do Deman and Johnson find this rather upsetting idea in Benjamin's essay? Perhaps the, way, the best way of approaching this problem is by reference to two similes that are used by Benjamin to describe the relationship between language and content in the original and the translation. In the original, says Benjamin, content and language constitute a certain unity, like that between a fruit and its skin. In a translation, on the other hand, language surrounds content as if with the broad folds of a royal mantle. The two similes seem to apply that the original, unlike the translation, shows completeness, a unity of content and language, which is lost in translation. But to Johnson, uh, to Barbara Johnson, Benjamin's similes mean the very opposite, revealed when the translator tries to achieve this presumable unity in his translation. Number seven in the handout. The vessel seems whole in the original language only because the skin and the fruit have been produced together. Any translation immediately has to separate them. The appearance of wholeness is fragmented the moment the signifier and the signified are linked by the folds of a different system of differences. Blinded by the mirage of wholeness in the original language, the translator nevertheless has no choice but to fragment the vessel. The original reveals its illusion of wholeness to have already drawn on resources that were at bottom arbitrary. The work of art has simply found a way to make that arbitrariness work for it. The precarious appearance of unity was achieved by using the fort fortuitousness of the original language, but in any, any other language, such luck falls apart. In other words, when the poem, let's the poem in the original, uh, shows a sort of, uh, you know, fruit and skin uh, tightness, this is only because it happened to be so in the original, but once you try to, tr to, to translate it, the two fall apart. I mean, the skin and the fruit lose their connection and, are, and show the basic um, uh, lack of wholeness in the original. The translator's task, according to Benjamin, says Johnson, is to separate language from content, signify from signified, and thus show their presumable unity of the original text to be illusory. According to Sondi, on the contrary, his task, the translator's task, is to bring language and content together, to embody in the language of the translation what was limited to content in the original. 
To the deconstructionist, every translation only breaks further what erroneously seemed like wholeness in the beginning. To the historian, every translation brings us nearer to what for Benjamin was to be wholeness in the end. Interestingly, however, Barbara Johnson too does not ignore the ultimate wholeness Benjamin envisages. Number eight, behind the diversity of languages, she says, Shim is a pure vessel whose unity no one will ever piece together. And yet, only translation can make it visible at all. Humpty Dumpty's great fall creates the desire to put, to put an egg back together again. But the wholeness translation reveals is not a restoration. The completion it points to is still and perhaps forever in human time, deferred. There's a famous difference. Johnson does not believe that the ultimate wholeness really exist, exists. She does not subscribe to any messianism. At the same, same time, she accepts that the piecing together of the fragments made visible by translation is structured as if the ultimate wholeness could exist. Although we are not progressing toward unity, and although every effort to patch the vessel together only breaks it further, unity indeed may well have existed in the beginning, she says. That is why the contrast between the two approaches is less cut and dried than it seems. To the deconstructionist, every translation only breaks further what seemed like wholeness in the beginning. To the philologist and historian Sondi, every translation brings us nearer to what will be wholeness in the end. But to Johnson, not less than to Sondi, the whole pure vessel shimmers behind the diversity of languages. <clears throat> and if to Johnson its completion is forever deferred and the vessel will never be whole, to Sondi, Jacobson's poetic function of language, his version of Benjamin's vessel, can never be fully realized if the poem is to say anything at all. Why is that the poetic function of language cannot be fully realized if the poem, poem is to say anything at all? Because the principle of equivalence, when fully realized, becomes tautology. And tautology, fully realized, is meaningless. A poem that consists of equivalent elements only would be reduced to a mere A is A is A is A. Therefore, the promotion from referential to poetic, from stated content to performed content that Sondi found in Celan's Shakespeare translation is finally an advance toward pure form empty of content or meaning towards pure language, towards silence. But isn't this precisely the direction that demands reading of Benjamin takes when he says that tra the translator, like the critical philosopher or, or the literary theorist, reads the original from the perspective of a pure language, a language that would be entirely freed of the illusion of meaning, I'm quoting him, pure form if you want. And in doing so, he brings to light a dismembrance, a decanonization, which was already there in the original from the beginning. Paul de Man, Baba Johnson, and Peter Sondi all subscribe in the last analysis to Benjamin's belief that all the translation can do is to point toward the inaccessible domain 
where languages are reconciled and fulfilled. This ultimate domain remains inaccessible, never fully realized to Sondi, forever deferred to the man and Johnson. At this point beyond words, a point of total silence, structuralist poetics and deconstruction strangely shake hands. One may well ask what all this has to do with translation proper, with our daily struggle as translators of literature to create an acceptable equivalent in our target language to a text in the source language. In Benjamin's own case, the connection between his essay and his Baudelaire translation, to which his essay is the introduction, seems rather feeble. He seldom, if at all, carries out his own call for a radical literal translation, which would break through the rotten barriers of his own German and let the light of pure language shine through. At the same time, I find that what seems like Benjamin's extremely abstract discussion touches on the translator's most secret and concrete wish to go beyond both the language of the original and of the translation and do justice to a pure meaning or to a pure music beyond the limits of words. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting presentation. I do not want to go into Benjamin's uh, translation concept as such, because I think as you said already a lot about it, and can he said perhaps much more about it. What I rather want you to bring in is the, the dimension of time. Because I think we read Benjamin as a sort, we, we enshrine Benjamin in a kind of, of um, sacred text, which I think it is, of course. But still, um, I think when we read Benjamin and when we analyze Benjamin's text of 1923, um, I always get the impression um, we, we, we try not to bring in too many of the, of the developments whatever we can call it, of, the, of other concepts of translation which were developed after 23. So I, I was just wondering how you see this kind of problem, especially in relation, in relation to the text by Poydemann and Barbara Thompson, because it is my feeling that they too do so, but at the same time they bring in the deconstructuralist thinking, which is, from, of course, which is based on completely different epistemologies. So I'm just wondering how you see this relation between the viewing uh, generally, not Benjamin's concept as such, but on reading him after 10 years, 20 years, 30 years after the text was published. Um, and, and to make it a bit more complicated, um, I was wondering how you see this in connection with Paul Celan. Because Paul Celan, he was already very much aware of the complexity of the translation concept, um, uh, of, of the translation activity as such. Um, so um, even if he, I don't know exactly when he published this, uh, this Shakespeare uh, uh, translation. He did some 20 songs. Okay, yes. I, I don't, and he translated, I don't yeah, he was translating quite a lot of Shakespeare. Yeah, I um, so I was just, because um, when he translated it all this book, German, he already became aware of the very, very ambiguity of the translation activity. So I think he was very much aware of it. So in which way can you connect this once again with the, this kind of, of, uh, of approaching the, the, the dimension of time to, to the translation? Uh, if I understand you, 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 you're claiming that all sorts of developments have succeeded Benjamin's thing. I mean, Benjamin wrote it in 23. In the meantime, there are many 
uh, he has been discussed time and time again. I think the bibliography of, uh, of this particular, as you said, it's considered as a sacred text and a lot has been written about it. But um, I mean, uh, De Man is in 83, uh, 1983. Uh, Barbara Johnson wrote it in the early, uh, some 10, 15 years ago only which only shows that the problems are alive and that one can, uh, I mean, that, that uh, Benjamin's uh, ideas are so fruitful and interesting that every, I don't know, every decade finds its own interpretation of, of, of this. As far as Celan is concerned, I don't know whether there are any uh, any evidence of what he thought about translation? I mean, he translated a, a huge. I mean, the, the the volume in his in his collected writings, the volume including his translations, is huge. I think it has about a thousand uh, pages, and it includes Russian poetry and uh, and French poetry and what have. Um, what what Sondi was trying to show is that Celan, uh, unlike um, unlike uh, others, was already trying to do something that was uh, uh, that was definitely symbolist, you know, that was definitely trying to make poetry uh, perform its message rather than just declaring its message. And um, I think that he did prove it in this case because there are many lines here that can be shown to, to do this. As far as uh, Celan's other uh, translations are concerned, it's difficult for me to tell because I haven't really um, studied them. I've translated Celan himself into Hebrew. And um, um, I think that uh, Celan is a poet paradoxically easy to translate. Why? Because in spite of his uh, vocabulary, which is very, you know, very archaic very often or scientific, it takes, you know, he takes uh, uh, words from, uh, I don't know, everything, biology, mineralogy, and this and that, and, and sometimes medieval German. And that. In spite of that, he's not really uh, relying primarily on sound the way Mallarmé would. I mean, he, his main, his, his, his um, forte, you know, his strength is in his imagery. And imagery, you know, like the, the uh, black milk of morning the, in the tort tortoise fuga, uh, which in Hebrew turns out to be very, I mean, easily translatable because Black and mourning are shachar veshachor, which is <laughs> which is pure luck. But uh, since his his main uh, power is in his images, images are easy to translate. I mean, images, unlike sound, are translatable. I think sound is untranslatable, and um, therefore his poetry, his own poetry. I find very often uh, not easy to translate, but possible to translate. That's what I can say. <laughs> Ma? That's complete heresy. Images are easy to translate because they have meaning, right? Uh -huh. You get a sense of the image, and that's what you translate. Yeah. Your ultimate meaning. Yeah. yeah. In saying that the imagery is what really matters here, with the content, and rather, yeah, yeah. Look. Uh, Benjamin himself was unable to, as I said, he was unable to carry out, you know, in practice what he theorized about because his translations from Baudelaire into, into German are very bad and, and definitely have nothing to do with his ideas of, uh, you know, of uh, literal translation which would break the German and, and make it transparent uh, for the light of, of God knows, of pure language. He didn't do that. It's just, I think translation is, in this famous essay, is, a, um, is an excuse for metaphysics. 
I mean, it's not really an essay about translation. It's an essay about our advance towards our Adamic, you know. OK. Any other comments, questions? No. OK. Oh, it's late. Did you know something you mean about Kabbalah? Are there Kabbalist ideas in these? Uh, there are Kabbalist ideas in, in, in Benjamin, certainly. In, in in this particular, in this particular essay, uh, look, as far as, you know, pure language has certainly to do with, uh, the with yeah, with breaking the vessel. Yeah, the vessel image, definitely, with a, uh, and the tikkun of the vessel. Shvirat, uh, uh, definitely, I mean, Sholem introduced him to all this, and uh, he read he read Sholem and uh, and knew this definitely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.